All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in today for this incredible webinar that we have planned for you. It's going to be all about public speaking. And I was actually just telling Chad and Jessica that I'm going to learn a lot myself today as well. This is a topic that can help everybody, no matter what you do. Um, so I'm very excited to hear him speak. And um, as you guys know, my name is Ginger. I'm with Connectionology Seminars of America. We're glad to have you here with us. And I know that you might have some really good questions. So I'm hoping that you'll put those in the Q&A box so that way Jessica can keep an eye on them. And we'll kind of ask them throughout the webinar as we go and help make this conversational. Later on, you're gonna meet our incredible partners over at HMR, On Point, Fox AE. And then we might have a special pop-in surprise guest join us as well. I'm not gonna announce who that is just yet. Um, but let's go ahead and get started because we have a lot we're gonna cover. Um, for those of you who do not know Jessica, um, she is actually an incredible trial lawyer who works with John Romano out of the Romano Law Group in West Palm Beach. And she's actually a Palm Beach County native. Um, but prior to joining John with the law firm, she served an, as an assistant state attorney where she gained a lot of invaluable trial and litigation experience. And then she joined the private sector working for a prominent civil litigation defense firm handling a lot of complex litigation matters. And um, currently she focuses a lot of her practice on representing plaintiffs in the catastrophic injury matters, including wrongful death, auto negligence, medical malpractice, premises liability, as well as product liability. And I'm also immensely proud of her because she's getting some incredible verdicts right now too. Um, so congratulations, Jessica, for that. And then also the work that you do with your clients. Um, outside of her litigation practice, she also serves as the chair for the Palm Beach County Bar Association's Lawyers for Literacy Committee, as well as serving as a director for the Palm Beach County Chapter of Florida Association for Women Lawyers Programming Committee as well. In addition to that, she also serves as a president of the Lake Worth High School Alumni Foundation, and she sits on the board of the Lake Worth High School Dollars for Scholars, which is a nonprofit foundation that supports academic access in the community. So Jessica, we are thrilled to have you with us today. It is such an honor and I am really excited to see what we're gonna learn. <laughs> Thank you, Ginger. And I am so excited because this is one of my favorite topics, public speaking, and we are graced with the presence of Chad Mance today, who, if you don't know him, is a trial lawyer who represents people injured by the negligence of others, in Georgia and in occasion other states. So I believe he's in Savannah, Georgia, which everybody loves Savannah. So uh, he's also frequently asked to speak at trial advocacy and personal injury conferences. He lectures at some of the nation's largest trial advocacy conferences, such as John Romano's workhorse, the Connectionology Seminars of America. He also does National Trial Lawyers, TBI Med Legal. He speaks at the Georgia's annual convention uh, in Mass Horse Made Perfect, amongst others. So if you haven't heard him speak, this is a great opportunity to hear him and get to know him. He has spoken and written about everything from how to cross-examine a biomechanical engineer to how the federal motor carrier safety regulations apply to trucking, uh, trucking cases. He does public speaking for trial lawyers to examinations of injured persons, uh, from negligent security cases to transitioning uh, single event practice into mass torts. So he's, he's got a slew of things on his resume, uh, and I won't tell you about them all because I'm sure you're going to get to know him very well today. So I'd like to introduce at this time, Chad Mance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Ginger. And uh, thank you to our sponsors. Um, first, uh, I want to address the audience by saying thank you for coming and uh, really interacting with us uh, on the dreaded topic, public speaking for trial lawyers. Public speaking is sort of the foundation of what we do as trial lawyers. And there are some tricks, uh, but much of this is based upon principles that have pre-existed us literally for thousands of years. And they date back to Aristotle, Plato, and Cicero, for example. And so we're going to get into some practical tips 
and we're going to get into some things that are, are going to uh, be things that you can lift out of this presentation and immediately apply to your oral arguments, to your depositions, to your closing arguments and opening statements, uh, and so forth. And so without further ado, I am going to get into public speaking for trial lawyers. And we're going to, I'm going to share my screen with you. And we're going to begin this presentation. So one of the most important things when it comes to public speaking for trial lawyers is going to be gauging your audience. This is the starting point for any public speaker. And by gauging the audience, what we're really trying to do is to ferret out what is going to move the audience to get on our side so that we can achieve a certain result. And an audience can be an audience of one, for example, a judge, or in the alternative, an audience can be an audience of many, i.e. a jury. And sometimes if we're giving CLE presentations, for example, an audience of many can be an audience of many learned folks like lawyers. So what we're really gauging is what is the value system collectively of the folks that we're talking to? Are these folks that are moved by more esoteric arguments? and citations, for example? Are they moved by details? Or are they moved by something that is much more blue collar, uh, something that is much more grassroots or populist? We're trying to find this out before we get to the audience and before we craft our message. In doing so, we look at things like education, work, body language, we can't see body language, for example, until we get in front of the audience, but because our speech or our message is a living thing, we're adapting it based upon what we're seeing in visual cues from the audience. The region that you're in is important. What organization are you appearing in front of? And so forth. But most importantly, uh, the reason for the speech. Why are you here? What brought about the occasion? These are things that invariably factor into how we gauge the audience. Importantly, there is no one size fits all analysis. This is person and audience dependent. And you've really got to do some background research to figure out who it is uh, that you are speaking in front of and how best to move the audience to a desired result. Eye contact. Uh, you might notice I'm, if I'm looking to the side here, um, that seems not only awkward, but it is less persuasive. But if I turn to you and I'm engaging you by staring directly in my camera, somehow I become more trustworthy. Somehow I'm less of a threat. Most importantly, the eyes, most people think, and I tend to believe this as well, are invariably a window to the soul. So in public speaking, in order to connect, we have to make eye contact. But if you're in a room full of folks, maybe you're not locking eyes on one individual. Maybe what you should do is to pan the room, to look directly in front of you, for example, to look to the left, to look back in the middle, to look at the right side of the room. This panning exercise allows you to connect with the audience. And most importantly, if it's done naturally, it is a group discussion and not just shoving content down um, the throats of the folks that we're speaking to. It has to all be in context. So if you picture eye contact as a, an avenue, for communication, it's not a one-way street. It's a two-lane, multi-directional superhighway. And just like we're reading the audience, the audience is reading us. 
And good public speakers will say, oh, wait a minute, I lost this person. This person's avoiding eye contact. Perhaps I adjust my message here. Well, wait a minute, this person is leaning in or uh, nodding or showing some eye contact that might, for example, show additional engagement. And so the message may be crafted uh, to meet the body language uh, information that we're getting on site. Now, everybody who has seen the Amada Aubrey trial, I want to pick on this lawyer, has, has probably seen this. And this is uh, a pretty critical part of the case. Uh, of course, this lawyer lost his case, uh, but he's looking down at the paper as he's making an argument um, in the case or exam. I think he's actually examining a witness. Um, an important part of eye contact is that eye contact establishes trust. If there's no eyes, then there's no trust. Now, the next part of public speaking is voice inflection. Uh, it's important to know that we send non-visual cues whenever we raise or lower our voice. And sometimes if there's no change or inflection in our, in our voice, our message tends to get drowned out. So for example, if I'm talking to you at the top of my lungs the entire time and you feel like I'm yelling at you, the whole message appears to be uh, almost a verbal threat. It's too aggressive. But let's say I'm talking to you calmly and we uh, engage a point that is particularly significant. And I raise my voice uh, to make sure that the audience gets this non-visual cue about how important it is. The voice inflection then is sort of a roadmap for the importance of the content, particularly as it relates to its emotional significance. And so a lot of folks tend to think that if we raise our voice, then we are dramatically making our point in the most dynamic way. But sometimes if we whisper, the whispering alone is far more effective than raising any voice. And so we have to make strategic trade-offs. Uh, if we're talking to a jury, we, we need to keep in mind that we need to uh, appear like we're folks at a neighborhood bar or a community association meeting. And we want to be familiar to the audience that we're talking to. And we don't wanna turn people off by voice inflection. We don't wanna be preachery in a, for example, in a, a, a crowd of intellectuals, uh, but we don't wanna to be too intellectual in a crowd full of, uh, blue collar workers. We have to read the audience and voice inflection allows us to be able to present the content in a way uh, that is appealing. Now, voice inflection also combines with cadence. So you might notice, you know, good speakers sometimes or when they deliver speeches, they may have a sort of rhythm to how they speak or when they speak. Uh, they may speed up, for example, or slow down, uh, but that cadence and the voice inflection allow you to be able to emphasize content in unique ways. Now, everybody knows Martin Luther King Jr. Um, his style of speech was more uh, preachery and uh, rhetorical than anything, uh, but I wanna give you this example of the I've been to the mountaintop speech, which is some people say his seminal speech, but it is a great example of voice inflection. Let's play this briefly. All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. <laughs> China or even Russia or any totalitarian country. Maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. 
But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly, somewhere I read of the freedom of speech, somewhere I read of the freedom of press, somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest by right. All right. So without playing the entire speech, you can see Dr. King does many of the things we talked about. He's panning the audience, looking from the middle, going to one side of the room, back to the middle, to the next side of the room, back to the middle, and so forth. He's also raising his voice at emphatic points of the speech and lowering it uh, for less dramatic points of the speech but he increases and decreases uh, the rate at which he's speaking in order to make points as well. So this is sort of a good omnibus presentation of a variety of public speaking skills sort of wrapped in one. To the next part, which is, Cadence and speed. So when we talk about cadence, there's several points that, I, that I'd like the audience to remember. First, um, cadence commands attention to key points. And so whenever we change the rate at which we speak, our, our brains are cued in to notice that for some subconscious reason. And similarly, when folks deliver speeches in front of audiences, audiences know when there's the slightest change in the rate of speech. And a good speaker is going to plan out uh, kind of how cadence is gonna go. Now, you're not gonna plan so much that things aren't natural, uh, but you are gonna take note of what's emotionally congruent with the substance of the speech. Slow generally is better. And the reason why slower is better is our brains need time to catch up. And you want to speak at a rate that allows the uh, person in the audience that needs the most time to catch up to be able to follow you. But generally, slower is better. Also, uh, when we speak slowly or more slowly, we allow ourselves time to think. You might notice some speakers, particularly presidents when they give speeches, tend to start out very slow. That is not only because the presidents tend to wanna to build momentum in the speech, but also because the presidents are gathering their thoughts and trying to deliver the message in a way uh, that is appropriate to the audience at hand. When you are doing all of this and considering cadence and speed, you have to remember to stay natural and don't adopt the style of uh, an individual that is not your style. Don't adopt mannerisms that are not your mannerisms. You have to be yourself or else the speech is not gonna come across appropriately. Now, as lawyers, we often use demonstratives and uh, demonstratives are not to be overused, but they're to be used effectively, uh, efficiently. And these are about four key rules that are good litmus tests for whether to use a demonstrative to convey a message. First, demonstrative should explain what is easily confused. So if you find yourself having to engage in a three to four to five sentence explanation about what's going on and losing your audience, maybe you should consider showing more than telling. But demonstratives in the end are also designed to enhance retention. So there's something about imagery that allows our brains to embed material faster than the spoken word. Uh, remember, language compared to 
you know, our visual cues as an evolutionary matter is a relatively more recent occurrence. And so our brains on a primordial level are designed to pick up images far better than they're designed to kind of sort through fancy flowery words. So for that reason, when we have a complex matter, demonstratives tend to be better communicative tools. Color also, uh, as kind of a sub point to that, is important. You know, red conveys danger. Yellow conveys caution. Blue conveys trust, for example. Green conveys life and energy and so forth. Colors have cues. So when we put our demonstratives together, we have to be able to incorporate all of these things to uh, convey the appropriate messaging to our audience. And in the end, good demonstratives will uh, encourage participation from any audience that we're delivering our messages to. Now, you might recognize this scene if you've studied Nick Rowley. And the reason why it's here is because Nick has embraced uh, a, a very living a definition of what a demonstrative is. And that is a demonstrative can be anything that can show better than you can tell. And I'm gonna play this clip from YouTube. And this was a case where uh, Nick Rowley in a brain injury case got an incredible result. But let's, let's watch him and we'll talk about what he's trying to do here. I think you might have heard me use the word self-preservation a couple of times. The cook going up, we went to this day. Yeah, I was there. I saw it happen. It did nothing. I didn't square my students. The truth is, it's kind of a school tradition here to beat the hell out of the most of these mascots. No, boys will be doing it, right? And I mean, come on, Miss Carter. He got the mascot in the corner. Hey, you could bring him up himself. This is the only one in history of Florida. This is the property on the nine. This is a piece of evidence so I'll prevent as as long as it's uh respected uh respectful and it seems it's very important to march for her. Yes, Your Honor. So you put the fish card and put this on. What do you do? What do you do with the fish? You never use the same. Because this is fun. This is because, yeah. Wanted attention? What's the evidence show? This is because he wanted to help his school because he cared. He's willing to throw on something. States. He's actually taking the role of something. That is crazy. The Hurricane Teams mascot, well, something's going to make fun of it. Now the Hurricane Teams mascot for a lot of everybody up at the rack. Just like the teacher, Mr. Scott had done five years before when he had five ribs broken, ended up with a neck surgery, and down the body all four of them. Because Mr. Scott was doing it for the school too that he loved. He's a sweet loving man. So he put this thing on here, barely seeing it. All right. So 
Uh, the point that Nick is showing better than he can tell is that the act of being a mascot is not something that you do for fun. It's an embarrassing, humiliating, inherently ridiculous act. And so the defense's intimation that his client asked to be pummeled is just utterly ridiculous. And the jury remembered that and returned a significant result. Now, you might notice that the defense objected. And they said, Your Honor, this is improper, stating no legal basis, of course. But the judge said, uh, you know, it's a rhetorical device, right? Uh, which I think that's an apt term, although we know that it's demonstrative uh, and it's not evidence. But for what we're talking about here, it is a rhetorical device, not just demonstrative evidence. Demonstrative stuff is rhetorical. Um, in our state, at least in Georgia, demonstratives can go back to the jury. They don't have to. Um, but in other states, demonstratives might not go back to the jury. Nevertheless, the point of the demonstrative is the point that is to be made during the speech, not necessarily what goes on when the jurors examine it, for example, in Georgia, if we choose to allow it to go back to the jury and begin a discussion. It is the point that we want to make in the moment. And for Nick Rowley, that point was, my client didn't ask for this injury. The defense is frivolous allegation should be totally ignored. And I think um, Nick got an eight-figure verdict on this. All right, now to body language. Little things matter. How you walk to the podium matters. Posture. You see, I'm, I'm standing or sitting up more erectly now. That conveys authority. With my shoulders back and my, heads up, my head up, excuse me, now I'm in control of the audience. But if I lurch forward, I somehow appear weaker, less believable, unless I want to lean in and engage. It. And so how we carry ourselves how we carry our shoulders, how we look at the audience, the angles that we're presenting from all have a difference uh, that will relay a message to the jury about whether we should be believed or not. So when we sit at a table, for example, and our council table is messy, we're conveying negative uh, credibility messaging to the jury. But conversely, if the table is well organized, we're conveying that we should be believed. If we're sitting at council table like this, um, maybe we're not as engaged. But if we're sitting this way, perhaps we're analyzing the case. And so when we show up at trial, know that trial is a battle of images and know that even in oral arguments, the judge is paying attention to these things. And a body language is a primer for the quality of the things that you're going to talk about, the quality of your speech. So how you move, how you move your hands, how you move your body in general, um, how you point, how you move your head, all these things matter. And I found this uh, excellent summary of some of the things that show body language. Uh, from a variety of perspectives. You'll see here, uh, there's a pointing gesture, uh, which is accusatory. There is a questioning gesture, uh, which conveys a state of consternation. There is a, a waving gesture and, and so forth. But how we use our hands matters, right? Open palms, meaning acceptance, or maybe they mean question. Uh, all these things matter. Would y'all like to like to take a break now, Jessica? Or would you I like to? Gonna, I was just going to chime in and say that um, I saw Mr. Romano pop in, and we also want to bring in one of our partners.
Absolutely. And this has been such great chits. Um, I'm seeing so many awesome comments come in in the background, Chad. So thank you so much for presenting all of this to us. And um, let's see, I see John popping in at any moment, but in the meantime, what I'm gonna do is bring in, oh, there he is. All right, John, before you come on, I wanna play a special video for everyone real fast. Um, oh. And this is just a quick little break because I want everybody to know that we're having a very special seminar and there's still a few spots left um, to come to our Fort Worth Deposition Skills Seminar, which is September 14th through the 16th. But let me just play this real quick video for you. I'm going to bring in Rachel after John, and then we're going to get back to this amazing discussion. So let me play my video. And I hope everybody will be able to hear this okay, too. Hi, I'm John Romano, and I want to welcome you to this extraordinary we're going to be holding depositions our trial in Fort Worth at the Stockyard. I'll be doing this program with Pino Colombo, Joe Freed, and Satch Oliver and others. We're bringing our families together to work hard to put on one of the most extraordinary educational events ever. You know, as you look out here at the sea, there's a lot of serenity and calmness in the sea, and at other times, a vicious, angry storm. And in the distance, you can see the beautiful mountains with all the wildlife, the streams, the waterfalls. Yet over here, coming in, some pretty angry clouds. What are these all about? They balance one another to protect mother nature. Your job as a trial lawyer is to protect your client. It is to weigh and to balance all of the steps you need to take as an advocate, believing in your client, believing in his or her cause, and doing the right thing at the right moment for the right reason. Join us. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to learn a lot. And it's going to be one of the greatest networking experiences you have ever experienced. I tell you, I'd give anything to be there right now, John Romano. I, I felt like I was there. <laughs> well, welcome, Ginger, I just want to say uh, Jessica and Chad are doing a fabulous job here, teaching and training, inspiring, motivating, mentoring. It's, it's just so exciting. And uh, I want to say to everybody, thank you for being here and a part of the Connectionology webinars, but please consider coming out there to join us in Fort Worth. We are going to be doing a mega deep dive into everything having to do with how to win your case in depositions. How to understand that when you ask a doctor a, a, a question, a defense medical examiner, there's a good way to ask that question to get the answer you need. There's a better way. And then there's the optimal way, the best way. And what happens is all too often, lawyers just go in and think a deposition of a defense medical examiner is to go through some outline prepared by somebody else, pulled from a book, grabbed from a partner. That's not it. The idea is to win the case in each deposition understanding depositions or trial. So come out there September 14th to the 16th. Join us. We're going to have a great time. We're going to learn a lot and we're going to all hopefully inspire and motivate one another. So come on and join us. Ginger? You're on mute, Ginger. Thank you so much, John, for popping in today to say hello to all of us. And like John said, I hope you guys go to connectionology.com to look up all the details, the agenda, all the fun events that we're going to be doing there, as well as the incredible, just um, the way that you guys have built this agenda. I mean, I've never seen anything like it, John. So to get one-on-one -on -one time with you and all of our other amazing speakers is incredible. So we hope to see everybody there. Thank you for being here today. And now I'm excited, you guys, because Rachel is back with us from On Point Legal Nurse Consulting, another one of our amazing companies that we work with. And I hope Rachel's going to come with us to Texas, too. Um, but we are so excited to see you again, Rachel. We've missed you. Thanks for coming. 
Hi, thanks. Can you tell us a little bit? I actually oh, just can you tell us a little news bit? today that oh. I am going, so I will see you there. Wonderful. Um, oh, I'm so happy. I'm so excited. So on point, we are a legal nurse consulting and full litigation support firm, and we've been supporting attorneys for over 25 years on all types of cases involving injury and illness. Um, we have five key programs and areas that we can assist you in. So we do medical record retrieval and organization. We can retrieve the records and organize them, bookmark them, OCR, optical character recognition, and get them back to you within a timely manner. We have a consult program where all of our consult nurses are US trained and we match them to the type of case that you have. We do chronologies and timelines and case analyses um, and we can point out strengths and weaknesses in your cases. We can point out the missing records and retrieve those for you. And we can identify any types of red flags. We also have a really strong nursing home and long-term care program, which assists with any long-term care related cases from simple thumbs up to thumbs down merit screen to specialized experts who are familiar in the standards of care and guidelines. Um, we also have our damages program where we can quantify damages and we have great life care plans that we offer and we can also offer medical cost projections and we also do great pain and suffering reports. And lastly, with our expert witness program, we provide fresh, well-rounded experts in any specialty needed. Um, they are all clinically active and located nationwide. And there's also no risk and no cost for us to search for the expert and we can provide you with multiple and you can kind of just pick and choose. Um, so basically I just like to consider on point your one-stop shop and we're here to help you avoid any of your surprises and to help simplify the medicine for your case. Um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. I'll put my information in the chat and I hope to see some of you out there in Texas. I'm excited. Rachel, uh, that was wonderful. We do look forward to seeing you out there in Texas. And I can't thank you and the folks at On Point enough for all you've done with Connectionology. Um, I've let people know that I, I brag about you all everywhere I go in the country. We have worked with you, our law firm, uh, has worked with you all for several years now. We intend to keep working with you. What I love about On Point is the responsiveness and the, the competence, the skill, the talent that each person at On Point brings to the table when we come to you to do a project or a case analysis. And as you know, I love the pain and suffering reports uh, that you do at On Point. I make a point to let people know you must get nurses involved in your cases. Nurses will take your client's cause to a different level. And uh, the way that you do it at On Point and the way you prepare the, the reports and work with the lawyers, it is just phenomenal. So thank you for all you do and thank you for being yeah. here today. Thank you, John. And Rachel, if you get a minute, be sure to put your information in the chat box. That way everybody can save your information and call you if they have any questions. But we're very excited you're coming. Can't wait to see you soon. Thank you. All right, guys. Um, well, Jessica will be joining us back here in just a little bit. But until then, um, Chad, if you're with us, I see a question that has come in. And um, if it's okay, I'll ask it to you real, real quick. Okay. All right, so this question comes in from Greg. Do you have any recommendations about effective ways and best practices to stylistically pick back up and continue speaking your speech when you have to deal with unexpected interruptions, for example, dealing with an objection or a judge interjecting a comment during an opening statement in a closing argument? Well, that's a great question. Um, the first thing that I recommend is that you pace yourself in how you're delivering the message and try to anticipate the objection in advance. If you cannot, pause for three seconds, take a deep breath, pick a uh, kind of a fixed location on the wall about uh, 
six inches above the head of the audience member that you're looking at, if it's a judge, for example. And that way you can avoid eye contact if that makes you nervous. And then that gives you enough time to, your, for your brain to catch up with the eventual message and for you to deliver a crisp response. That is fantastic. Thank you so much, Chad. And um, so I see Jessica is back with us, you guys. So Chad, feel free. We can go back right into the presentation. Um, and we really appreciate it. This is great information. OK. Uh, we were talking about movement matters. And movement does indeed matter when we are conveying a, a message. That's because our body language is the vast majority of our communication not what we say, but how we appear to say it. So for example, hand movement alone is a whole encyclopedia on uh, gestures and body language. If we point, maybe we're making an emphatic point for you to remember. If I turn my index finger and do this, somebody's in trouble, right? But if I do that, I'm saying that I'm not in trouble. Uh, similarly, if I have a closed hand, this is a gesture of righteous indignation. It's also a gesture of power, and it's also a gesture of control. Uh, but if I'm doing this and chopping my hands, then this is a, a gesture of righteous indignation and also a gesture that, that kind of makes an emphatic point about a particular uh, subject. But we can expound our hands in a circular movement, and that means we're explaining things. So how we're using our hands in a speech is really important. And everybody's hand gestures are different. And you have to know what's natural to you uh, you shouldn't be robotic and try to do what other people do, how they do it. And it's going to look weird, just like that looked weird just a second ago. But if it's natural, if it is sort of how you would talk at a dinner table, uh, then it is going to come off in a credible way uh, to your audience. Now, Johnny Cochran knew this, and he knew it well. You might notice uh, this scene from the O.J. Simpson trial, and this is his walk to the podium. But what's important is, A, his posture, and B, how he has his hands. Mr. Cochran is seizing control immediately. Now, I also want to point out what's going on in the backdrop. You see this young lady here. She is uh, fixed on Mr. Cochran. You see the bailiff here he is attentively watching what's about to happen. Not imagine that there are a number of others around. And that's because Mr. Cochran, by doing this triangular gesture as he walks to the podium with his hands, is saying, I'm the head honcho. Notice his hands aren't to his side, like he's sheepishly walking to the podium, uh, nor are his hands both in his pocket. His hands are cupped nicely in front of him, like he's preparing to say something incredibly important. How we have our hands from the moment that we begin to approach the podium in a trial or at a hearing, for example, sends a message to the decision maker. And you might know this gentleman here, Mr. Brian uh, Panish. I believe this was a trial he had uh, against the transit system where he got a good eight-figure result, but he's making a point. And that point is that the transit system had a debt that it had to pay and that it is absolutely lying about damages and everything else. But Mr. Panish's body language is congruent with the message that he's conveying. That is, somebody's in trouble and somebody's got to pay. He didn't even have to say it. His body language did. So beyond body language, 
and vocal inflection and the other things that we talked about, what are some things that are tools of a trial lawyer to really convince? The first and most common thing that we see is repetition. Now by repetition, I'm not just talking about saying the same thing ad infinitum or ad nauseum. Instead, what I mean is repeating things at key points that dramatically convey the importance of the message without offending the listener. So you've heard of the rule of three. I came, I saw, I conquered is what Caesar said. Um, and if you really listen to the uh, major rhetorical works of our time, uh, you'll, you'll pick out rules of three everywhere. It may be in how we structure our sentences, for example. Perhaps we have three parallel clauses uh, when we make a point. Uh, or it might be that we have three words, juxta three sets of words juxtaposed in the same parallel way. It could mean that we have a theme with just three words and nothing else. But three is an important number. And three is a number that allows us to convey a message in a way that is uh, persuasive, but it doesn't beat the horse until it's dead and continue to beat the horse until the audience is totally lost. Analogy is important. And now when we talk about analogies and when we're gonna use them, remember analogies are teaching devices. The uh, best teachers in ancient times used analogies. Plato and Aristotle used analogies. And that's because sometimes when we are taking a new thought and attempting to reconcile it with what we already know, the brain will associate the new idea with older information to reconcile it and synthesize it. And so what the analogy does is it makes an explicit connection between a foreign idea and an idea that has been around and is familiar with us, and it directly aids comprehension. But a metaphor is a comparison without the words like or as, for example. But metaphors give us vivid imagery uh, that are not, it's not easily, for example, disregarded or forgotten. Acronyms are great to convey uh, memorable points in juxtaposition. You know, Mo, Mo Levine is great at that. Many of the great trial lawyers are good at taking two opposite ideas and putting them side by side to convey a point. Uh, rhetorical questions are also something that we've seen good trial lawyers do. And you, you might've heard Nick Rowley a, a few minutes ago use his version of what I think are really Mo Levine's rhetorical questions. But rhetorical questions, of course, being questions that suggest the answer but don't state them, are great analytical tools to help folks begin to follow how they should be questioning things later on. Of course, alliteration, when we use words that begin uh, with uh, vowels, side by side the same vowel, that is a good way to make a point in a punchy, memorable way, but that can be overused. The same thing with consonants, and consonants is just almost the opposite of alliteration. We're taking consonants, words that begin with a consonant and putting them side by side, uh, using the same consonant to make the point. But there are a variety of ways to make a point and rhetorical devices have to match the audience, the point, and they also have to match the stage in the speech that you're in. If you're in the uh, infant stage of the speech where you're developing it and there's not yet a crescendo, then it might not make sense to have, uh, for example, a punchy line with a rule of three. But perhaps you wanna lead with a theme in a trial, and you state your theme outright, and that theme is a three-word thing. My point is this, 
the rhetorical devices have to match the specific speech at the specific time with the specific audience that you're convincing. Mo Levine, <laughs> I'm gonna play this. Mo was, uh, he was a rhetorical genius, uh, but he, he mastered juxtaposition in the rhetorical question. Let's hear Mo talk and we'll talk about what Mo is doing in just a second. You are concerned about the fact that if you find such a verdict, the amount you will have to access may be burdensome to him. If you feel that the damage which was done, even though negligently done, is irreparable, and that money damages cannot restore this child to its former health, but can only result in punishment to the defendant, even though the amount awarded is commensurate for the damages suffered. If those are the reasons for your verdict, your verdict might be right, but your verdict would have been for the wrong reason. Because the only reason you may have for rendering a verdict in favor of the defendant is that he did nothing wrong. Now, now let's stop there. Mo goes on and on. He is um, a bit of a genius, but he is taking two ideas, right and wrong, placing them side by side, and he's conveying this point that you have to have the right verdict for the right reason. And if you have the right verdict for the wrong reason, then it's the wrong verdict. But when we take two foreign ideas, two opposites, and put them side by side, something happens in the brain uh, where we uh, better remember the points that are being conveyed. And juxtaposition is a great rhetorical device to point out paradoxes in a case, to point out truths in a dramatic way, or to point out the absence of truth. Think about these things when you're crafting your closing arguments. And sometimes when, when appropriate, you might even want to put them into oral arguments, but don't go too far. Oh. Mo also, uh, and perhaps uh, as everyone knows, was, was probably the most gifted trial lawyer at, at posing rhetorical questions. Let's listen to Mo pose rhetorical questions and talk a bit more about what he's trying to do here. Take from Jenny a dream. And what is Jenny? Not an inferior person, but she's not Jenny. What damages do you arrive at for this transfiguration of a human being? for this robbing her, albeit not willfully, but negligently robbing her of her identity. Do you see what I'm talking about? I'm talking about her right to choose her lifestyle has been altered and taken from her against her will and without her concurrence, it's been taken from her. She cannot act. She cannot dance. I'm not talking about her pain. She could live with that pain. She's young. She will heal. If she cannot heal herself, others will heal her. It will cost money. So what? She will have pain. She will learn to grow with pain. Life is pain. Part of living is stress. Without stress, there is no life. It's the meaning of life. Stress would not bother her, but her lifestyle has been altered and she has been altered and she has been stopped from doing what she wanted to do and she is not the same girl and she has been changed. Whether for better or for worse is irrelevant. She is not what she was and she has not chosen to be changed and there must be compensation for it. All right. So you heard at the beginning Mo's questions. But you'll notice sometimes he implies the answer to the questions, 
afterwards, and then other times he will overtly answer the question. What good is life when life is a life of pain? Perhaps Mo would say, you know, I'm not sure exactly what he said after, but let, let, let me pretend that I'm, I'm Mo. What good is life if little Jenny has to live and work in pain? Isn't life about living happily in pleasure? And what happens when all the pleasure that Jenny has is less pain? Is that really life at all? You see what we're trying to do here? We're, we're making a point through questioning, which kind of tracks the analytical process of at least one juror. And by asking these questions overtly, we're engaging the analytical process directly and not just making our points for the jury to analyze later. We're participating in that process by posing questions that suggest the answer. Now, when we're crafting a message, we should always keep in mind our themes. And in our line of work, there are certain themes that always seem to appear in cases. And these are uh, relatively universal themes that everybody should think about in almost every single case that you've got. I promise you, all of us have cases in here right now that you can adopt these themes in if you have not already. And one is uh, choice theory. So there's something that goes on uh, when we can identify folks who have made an affirmative decision to do something. And for example, are not passive, complacent recipients of a status quo. And when people make strategic choices, that's unlike unintentional act. So when we do our cases, when we put them together, we should always be framing them from a position of choice and not what the defense would like, which is a loss of control. Uh, similarly, profits versus safety or profits versus people is a recurring thing. If we want to tie profits to poor safety decisions, for example, one reason is, uh, of course, it gets us closer to punitive damages, but the other reason is it establishes motive and blameworthiness. And this is a theme that we've read about as children. It's a theme that we've read about and studied as adults and seen in the newspapers and the media, for example. And it is a universally uh, easy theme uh, to identify with. Systemic error is also a, a theme that we see in a lot of cases. Lies is a theme. Power, family, and love are also themes. Now, these themes don't always have to be the single dominant thing in the case. You can have two or three themes in a case, one main mother theme and several sub themes, for example. But we should always be looking at power themes that are uh, easily identifiable in a case. Uh, that are clearly supported by the evidence and that our audience will uh, say, hey, look, this, is, this matches my value system. I believe this. So Mark Lanier is great. Um, he is uh, uh, another genius and he is making a point using consonants and uh, one of his uh, bigger verdicts, which was the tout verdict that he had in San Francisco. Uh, excuse me, not San Francisco, St. Louis, excuse me. Too many S's going on here. Uh, and I want you to listen to Mark make his point. And this is just an example of how one might use consonants in a case. What you learn from all of these points is And the job is to show or determine who's responsible. If the evidence says it's going to be Johnson and Johnson, and the responsible party needs to be brought to justice. And as I told you in opening, it's an easy thing to do. We've seen it on TV. You just follow the evidence. You've got to look for the moment. 
showed you the money. Money that was money. You've got to look at the means. They go back to the they did it for the time. You examine the injuries, look carefully at the ladder pad for bigger. All right. Uh, without going through all of that, he used consonants to make a pretty important point about money that ties into our profits versus safety thing, motive, and means. Money, motive, and means. He's taking these words that all begin with the same letter. He's tying them in using the rule of three. And he is dramatically making this point at the outset. And this is a major theme in that case that led to uh, a great verdict for Mark. When we are putting together themes of, for our cases, we have to em employ the best rhetorical device to have the most dramatic effect on the list. Hey, Chad? Yeah. Um, sorry, uh, is now, can we take a little bit of a break so we can hear from some of our partners? Do you mind? Perfect. All right, thank you. Fantastic. And Mark Lanier, I agree with you, Chad, is incredible. Um, the video was a little bit hard to hear. So the next video that we play, let's just make sure that we'll, we'll have the sound all the way up, but um, he, he's amazing. Um, and look who just popped in, you guys. Blue Edwards with HMR. We are so excited to see you again, Blue. Um, thank you so much for coming in today so you could tell everybody a little bit more about what you guys specialize in. Um, as you know, we love working with you guys, and I really, really hope that everybody watching um, will save your information after you speak as well because you guys do such good work. We love working with your team. And I know Ted will be popping in later for the coffee giveaway, um, but that's always like a great joy that we do so it's always good to see him but thank you for being here with us today thanks ginger it's always a pleasure and hello everyone chad jessica great webinar today lots of uh fantastic nuggets of information in there so very enjoyable uh so who is hmr so hmr servicing uh we are the premier funding source for personal injury plaintiff law firms nationwide um, there are three points that I would like to touch on today, um, the first of which being uh, case cost funding. So a lot of times, you know, you need experts or life care planners or, you know, things like that to shore up your case and to, and to really go out there and get the best, uh, you know, the best settlement, the best outcome for, for everyone involved. Um, these things are expensive. And I'm sure, you know, uh, you guys have used experts before and they don't seem to be getting any, any cheaper. Um, but if that's a heavy lift, then, you know, give me a call. Uh, you know, we'd like to step in and, and help you out with that. Um, like I said, um, the second thing that I wanted to touch on today is the medical funding piece. Uh, so, HMR, we currently function in 39 states. And why do I bring that up? Uh, definitely not to brag, but uh, just to you know, let everyone know that we have providers nationwide that we work with. Um, and obviously, if you, you, know, you have your stable of providers that you like to work with, fine. You know, we're not trying to change that. We would like to work with them as well. Um, all the providers that we work with are uh, absolutely PI minded. They understand what we're trying to do here um, and, you know, get the client better, but also, you know, make sure that the reports, uh, you know, contain all the information that's needed, you know, for, for the attorneys to go and, and, and get the job done. So um, there's that. Uh, last but not least is the pre-settlement funding. Um, Obviously, this is a tough time for your client, um, maybe the toughest time of their life, right? Uh, maybe they can't pay their mortgage or uh, I've even had child support, right? Um, there's things that they need to keep paying in order to live and function. Uh, we understand that. So uh, if that's something where we could step in and help, uh, feel free to give me a call. Uh, like Ginger said, I'm going to leave my contact in the on the message board. And uh, yeah, always a pleasure, Ginger. And we look forward to seeing you in Texas coming up.
I am counting down. I think we're like seven and a half weeks to go, <laughs> but I cannot wait. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, thank you so much for all that you do, Blue. And I hope again, everybody will save your information. You guys are really doing a lot of good work over there at HMR. And we really appreciate you. Thanks, Ginger. All right, now I'm very excited because I see Vicki over there with us today. Um, as you guys know, she is Cody's, or better half, we like to say, <laughs> but we never get to see her as much as we want to. So we're really glad that she's here with us. Um, you guys know I rave about Fox AE because everything speaks for itself. Whenever they show like a video or a new clip or something that they've created, um, like you may have seen and met Nathaniel last week, which is one of their designers. Um, it just blows me away. So Vicki, thanks for popping in today to share with us a little bit more about what you guys specialize in. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Ginger. I'm happy to be here. Um, thank you, Chad, for the information. You better believe I've been taking notes for this public speaking. So and luckily, I'm with friends here, Ginger, uh, Jessica, Blue. It's great to see you all. So I have a good a good audience uh, to start with. But at Fox AE, we create animations and illustrations for trial and mediation. Our goal is to bring clarity to your case. Um, and we do that by, as Chad mentioned earlier, visually explaining the easily confused and enhancing retention for your audience. Um, and hopefully I can show you an example of that here. Great. Can you guys see that? Okay. Um, this is a case where the defense was trying to say it was a pre-existing condition. So we did a medical timeline to show all the treatments that she had to have after the incident, which as you can see, and hopefully this kind of burns an image in your jury or, you know, at mediation, it burns an image into their mind, 98 treatments. That's a lot of treatments. Starting in June of 2015, seven years long, let me, and then going through showing the time, showing the cost, showing some of the things that she had to go through. And then I'm gonna skip just a little bit. And then we show the treatments that she had for back pain before the incident. just one. So hopefully that makes the point something happened in this car accident. So that's what we do in a nutshell. We love doing it. We love working with you all. We love meeting you all at these conferences. Um, Fort Worth, we're also going to be there and looking forward to that so much. I cannot wait. And that was such a great image to kind of show everybody. Like you said, it speaks for itself when you see something like that um, and you can't make it up. I mean, that's right there. So it's um, pretty amazing what you guys do and you can create just about anything because you're working with such good people on your team. Um, Vicki, thank, thank you. you so much for being with us today. Please put your information in the chat because I know people are going to want to save it. So thank you for being with us and um, come back again tomorrow. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Maybe we'll see. <laughs> Thanks, Ginger. Thank all you right. all. Appreciate it so much. All right. Take care. Thank you, Vicki. All right. Chad and Jessica, I'm going to hand it back over to you. All right. Do y'all want to do questions? You know, we can go through this presentation at, at length, or we can just engage the audience. Jessica and Ginger, do you do y'all have a, a particular preference about that? Well, we haven't gotten any questions in the chat box yet, so I think if you just want to continue and then as people have questions, please put them in the chat box and then I will, I'll kind of interrupt you and then just ask you the questions and we can go that way. Okay, perfect.
share my screen with you. All right. Now, when we're talking about uh, public speaking um, and we are crafting an argument, there's certain ways that we can dissect arguments and put together arguments that are time tested. And um, I'd encourage everybody in here, if you haven't already, uh, to review logical fallacies, critical thinking. They aren't, those things aren't just for philosophy majors. Um, they are really tools of folks who debate subjects and can be used uh, quite frequently in what we do, particularly when we are writing briefs and more frequently when we're arguing a particular point in a case, an opening statement, we don't argue but we can still employ these fallacies. And in closing argument, we definitely can engage these, certainly can engage these on cross-examination and so forth. But uh, one of the things that's important is to identify assumptions, both in our argument and our opposition's argument. And the assumptions are kind of the glue that hold together the arguments. Um, but uh, aside from identifying the assumptions, we know, for example, a parade of horribles, the idea that, for example, um, you know, first they come in and they tell us what to do with our bodies. Then they come in our houses and they tell us what to do in our households. And then when that's not enough, they come in our schools and they take our, our kids' education away. This is an example of an argument that is saying, uh, once Pandora's box is opened, uh, there is a parade of bad things that happen as a result. Uh, the appeal to authority, for example, the idea if a defense lawyer comes along and says, look, Mr. Expert is telling the truth because he's published all of these articles, and all of these articles say that um, this point is true. And so because the articles show that uh, he is authoritative, he must be the figure that you believe. Or maybe they say, look, he's a Harvard-educated professor. Why not believe him? This is an example of an appeal to authority fallacy. Uh, causation for versus correlation. We see this quite often in uh, defense medical examination, uh, kind of expert testimony, or uh, what purports to be that. And the idea behind that is, look, these things happen really close together, and so one must have caused the other. But maybe they're just close together in time, and there is no common cause or relationship between the two uh, factors. Uh, ad hominem, uh, for example, when they come along and they say, hey, look, you know, your client was you know, doing something inappropriate at the scene. Why in the world should they be believed? They're attacking the person and not the issue. And then argument in absurdum. And what that is, is when you take your opponent's argument and you extrapolate it to its most ridiculous end, and we're going to see an example of that. Hopefully this video plays a little bit better. If not, we'll get into the explanations pretty quickly. This is an example of argument in absurdum. Ginger, let me know if this video doesn't play well. Uh, Jessica, let me know if this doesn't play well and um, we'll make adjustments. I was thinking. Can you hear that well? Okay. Last night about this case and their theory and how it didn't make any sense and how it didn't fit and how something was wrong. It occurred to me how they were going to Come here and stand up here and tell you how O.J. Simpson was going to disguise himself. He was going to put on a knit cap and some dark clothes and he was going to get in his white Bronco and this recognizable person and go over and kill his wife. That's what they want you to believe. That's how silly their argument is. And I said to myself, maybe I can demonstrate this graphically. Let me show you something. This is a knit cap. 
I'm gonna put this knit cap on. And you've been seeing me for a year. If I put this knit cap on, who am I? I'm still Johnny Cochran with a knit cap. And if you look at OJ Simpson over there, and he has a rather large head, OJ Simpson in a knit cap from two blocks away is still OJ Simpson. It's no disguise. It's no disguise. It makes no sense. It doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. All right. So what Mr. Cochran is doing a really good job of pointing out is the sheer absurdity of the defense's theory that O.J. Simpson was disguised. And he, he has a little humor in there. He says, and O.J. Simpson has a rather big head. Um, uh, you know, when we take our opponent's position and we take it to its most ridiculous logical end, what we're doing is, is we're showing every little gap in the argument that is unworkable, unbelievable, and it is so incredulous that the jury shouldn't believe it. And so argument in absurdum is a great tool on closing argument to show the logical end of the defendant's reason. Lang inside by some of the lawyers and one of the... All right. This, this is a lawyer from my state, uh, James E. Butler, uh, in a case with Chrysler. And this is an example of a, of a good use of metaphor. We got a buddy who likes to say it's important if he works all the time. He says this because he wants to remind himself and me that we need to try to remember this. He says, work to live. Don't live to work. Work to live. Don't live to work. The most important part of life is everything else. What did Reagan Walton lose? He lost everything. Family, friends, activity, joy, learning, growing up. He lost all the big things, maybe military service, education, dating, marriage, children. That's over to you, what it so I think it's important to remember. Mr. Turbo got up here and referred to George's Rome Fifth uh, statue as a quote crazy little concept. Crazy little concept. I think it's one of the most important things. In this society, we sanctify human life so much that if somebody is killed, people will fall for nothing. The measure of damages is the value of the dead person's life. But the person who dies, he himself. What did he lose? He lost the child of Christmas morning, ball game, tennis, spending time with his mom, spending time with his dad, enjoying their love and their embraces. He will never know the joy and experience. The joy and the heartbreak of his first love, he will never enjoy the years of dating. He will never enjoy learning to drive, getting a driver's license, feeling that freedom to go. He will never know the joy of getting that one special girl. But yes, he will never know what it's like his wife killing him with his son. He will never get to his parents saying, Really, we are so proud of you. He will never tell his own man and work in his own mistake. He will never get the best satisfaction of earning his first paycheck. He will never get to feel the joy of being a useful contributor to his family, to his community, and to his country. He will never get a chance to build and carry through an entire life with old group of friends and join that time together. He will never feel wrong. He rose up the front of him. He will miss. What well, most of us try not to take the bad each day is just to talk with sunshine, beer, and that's fine. He misses all the things. One of my favorite movies is Lonesome Dove. Where Gus McConnell talks about the sunshine and the beer. Yeah, Lonesome Dove is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, Lonesome Dove is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, Lonesome Dove is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, Lonesome Dove is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, Lonesome Dove is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, Lonesome Dove is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, Lonesome Dove is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, Lonesome Dove is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, Lonesome Dove is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, Lonesome Dove is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, Lonesome Dove is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, Lonesome Dove is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, Lonesome Dove is one of my fav
Now, what you just last heard was uh, Mr. Butler uh, invoke a classic metaphor uh, from a well-known source. And it took him some time to qualify uh, the, set, the stage for that metaphor, the buttermilk metaphor. Uh, and that's a metaphor that, of course, if you're in the South like me, uh, you know what a warm glass of buttermilk is like. It humanizes him, it humanizes his client, and it also makes the point that the wrongful death statute is a noble one that acknowledges even the most trivial, fleeting, culturally nuanced aspects of who we are. And the statute is a good thing. It's not some crazy little concept. And so Mr. Butler is, is very skilled and very eloquent with the, um, with the with sort of the cadence of a Southern preacher, but he is an excellent trial lawyer and he'll use a metaphor in a minute. He also has a really good metaphor in here. Uh, he'll, well, actually it's a demonstrative if you get a chance to watch this, he'll, he'll pull out a clock and the defense lawyer says, well, Remy Walden uh, couldn't have suffered that long. It was only so many minutes that he burned a lot. So he pulls out a little clock, grandfather clock, puts it on the uh, podium, and he allows that amount of time to go by. And he says, that's how long Remy Walden was burning alive. So very good, very good closing argument with a classic result in a, in a very conservative town. I encourage everybody to watch that. All right, now this is an example of the slippery slope. When you oversupply, people die. They get opioid use disorder. Families talk, fall apart. Babies get abandoned. The foster care system goes out of whack, and we have a billion dollars. There was a nothing in 1991 when they launched the music. Here in Jesus, there was a nothing. In 1996 and 1997, and they relaunched and tried to do opioids are safe for everyday pain. And then there was a something that something got worse and worse and worse. All right. Now you'll notice something really important about that opioid trial. Um, first, he did uh, what I thought was genius. He took the slippery slope argument. And he combined it with demonstratives. And the demonstrative itself showed the visual relationship between the parade of horribles. And so the argument, the, the verbal part of it, combined with the visual part of it, and it was all the more dramatic. Moral of the story is these devices are not to be used in isolation. You can use them in combination with each other. And oftentimes the most potent effect comes through a careful combination of one or more or two or more devices, excuse me. So here are a few uh, tips on oral arguments. And I think we all pretty much know these, uh, but I'd like to emphasize them again. It is really important to be succinct, not long-winded. Uh, judges hate that. It is important to be clear, unequivocal, simple, and comprehensive in what you're saying. If, for example, there is the slightest variation in your voice on a point, many judges who uh, just sort of show up to hear the oral argument and may not have read the brief may have the wrong uh, verbal cue that they're getting from you. And they might pick up on what the other lawyer is saying more than what they're uh, picking up on what you're saying. So you got to keep that in mind. Save the judge. Uh, find a way so that the judge can split the baby and still come to a favorable result for you. Uh, if you have to disagree, respectfully is a good word to use. Um, start out with a roadmap and stick to it. Don't stray from it unless the judge is asking you questions um, that are that are pertinent. And, e and even then, if you need to address the question and redirect the judge to the main central point. Uh, know where your roadmap is and know the most important points to convey. Also, um, oral arguments can have themes too, but it, don't use themes in, in too much of a kind of a preachery uh, rhetorical way. Might turn off the judge, but it is important 
to have a central theme that you want to drive home. Um, and, and judges sometimes suffer from bias too. Uh, that bias might mean that they prefer citations over, you know, common speak. Maybe it means that uh, they prefer that you stand at the podium and not stand where you are. You, you should know the judicial preferences, uh, the leanings of a judge when it comes to these things, and engage the, clerk, the clerks early before you appear in front of a judge, if you can. Um, if you don't have a pending case, you just spend time figuring out the judge's preferences and how the judges like to rule. That's knowing your audience. Um, you can flip the opposite sides thing too. And that's quite easy in a case, particularly when you have a legal rule that can apply uh, in a multifaceted way, both for and against an issue. Um, and in the end, you want to uh, keep in mind the legal buzz terms and, and, and that you're trying to solve the court's problem. You are the second clerk in the room. Uh, not in, not, you're an advocate, but you should picture yourself as the second clerk. And when you solve problems that way, you tend to get better results on oral argument. Closing arguments. Um, the, the, the Greeks wrote about ethos, logos, and pathos. And those things are still very much at play with what we do. Um, you know, ethos is your credibility. Uh, and it's the most important thing because if you don't have the credibility to speak, it doesn't matter how good your message is, it won't be received. And then logos is the logic that kind of comes from your message. That's the second part of the process. Your reasoning, the substance of what you're saying. And lastly, pathos is kind of the final step, which your emotional response that you're conjuring is an important part of the speech. You, ideally, you want all three present in strong measure in uh, what you're trying to convey. Um, now remember, in, in jury selection, uh, you're trying to learn who the jurors are, right? Uh, you have an idea, maybe you sent a questionnaire out uh, if you're lucky and the judge allows it. Uh, maybe you, you know something about the area having done research before you appear, uh, but maybe you don't. And maybe even if you did, uh, you need to get to know these folks more and you need to find the leaders. Jury selection is great for you to begin thinking, how do I frame this argument in a great way? Now, ideally you wanna have had focus groups before, but you don't know the jury until you're in front of the exact jury that you're in front of. Everything else is an approximation. So. Remember who the jurors tell you they are and get as much time during jury selection as you can so that you can begin crafting your uh, closing argument and your opening statement uh, presentations in a way that might be slightly more tailored uh, to the jurors. First and last impressions matter. Primacy and recency are still king in all of this. And so if you show up the wrong way in jury selection, for example, and you're not the leader, or uh, you show up the wrong way in closing argument, and you're not believable, those are gonna really hurt your case. And if you have to put in bad details, which we all do, remember, sandwich them between two good details, primacy and recency at work. Cross-examination. Um, Cross-examination also can rely on some of these subjects. And in fact, you can impeach a witness just through tone. And we're gonna, we're gonna find a great example of that in just a second. And sometimes when you have a really sophisticated witness, your cadence of your questioning can pin the witness down such that the witness can't think of a lie. If you're moving your questions along faster than the witness can think through the lie, then a lot of times you'll get impeachable material. But then sometimes you want to keep in mind that you get, a, get more with a kind tone than you do with an aggressive. Uh, so remember, 
Uh, there are a few other things on here, but remember these things. And, and just one or two of these things alone can improve the quality of cross-examination. Um, now, Bruce Lee makes an important point that I think we all should, should remember when it comes to cross-examination. And that's a point on fluidity. Let's listen to what he has to say. This is what it is, okay? You're talking the Long Street played by James Francisco. I said, empty your mind. Be formless, fruitless, like water. Now, you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. The water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. Is it you know, see, I get the idea. I, I get the um, So the point that Mr. Lee was making is that we should always be fluid enough in the cross-examination, which is a living, breathing thing in itself, exchange between lawyer and witness, uh, that we can adapt to the moment and take shape in the cross-examination as the examination dictates. Yes, have an outline. Yes, have themes. Yes, have done the work in the document with you. But do not be so married to a formulaic structure that you cannot get the very good stuff from the witness. And that's a whole different conversation in and of itself. But in doing these things, if you're familiar enough with the rhetorical devices, you can make your point in a way that is very memorable to a jury. Now, this is an example of Gary's, Gary Spence, excuse me. And what he's doing is he is, he is attacking the witness and impeaching the witness just using the tone of his speech. Let's, let's get an idea of how you can use tone to uh, poke at the credibility of a witness on cross. Well, you, um, you look like a nice fellow. My wife thinks so. Well, Mrs. Lee, I expect that uh, I expect that you believe here that uh, that the county is a negligent. That's true, isn't it? That's my belief. And uh, you want the jury to believe it, don't you? Certainly. As a matter of fact, uh, that's your purpose being here, isn't it? Is to kind of convince the folks on the jury that the county was a negligent. I'm here for whatever purpose you wish me to be here. Well, but wasn't that why you came was to convince the jury that the county wasn't negligent? I will provide the facts on our side, yes. Didn't you want to convince the jury that the county wasn't negligent? My attorney will take care of that. And don't you want to answer the question? It's all right if you don't want to answer the question. Uh, I'll ask you another one. If you were wanting to convince the jury that the county wasn't negligent, there are certain ways a fella could do that. Isn't that right? I suppose so. Certain techniques. You're more familiar with that than I am. Well, I don't know whether I am or not. I, I never did the uh, I never did have a coach to tell me how to testify. Did you have a coach? All right. So what Mr. Spence is doing is he recognizes the juxtaposition between the tone of this professional witness uh, who has clearly been coached by the county and him. And he is showing through his somewhat sarcastic questioning that this witness can't be believed, and the very essence of his testimony is just ridiculous. It's coached, and all he's going to say is that the county wasn't negative. But the tone itself, if you really look at, listen to the question, and you substitute the con content, uh, if we were to change the content altogether, just hearing that tone makes you say, he thinks this witness is totally ridiculous. 
how we say our questions also sends a cue, a cue to the audience. That's the important thing that I want you to remember on cross-examination. Yes. All right. So um, when you think about opening statements, remember that you should introduce, frame, contextualize, and press and organize your content. Um, and when you think about CLEs, remember you got to solve a, uh, a recurring problem and you should engage the audience and uh, you got to make a strategic choice about whether to use war stories or whether the audience wants to, uh, for example, engage in other types of content and uh, whether to entertain and how much to do that. So these are just a few uh, points on a CLE presentation. So at this time, I want to kind of zoom through the last pieces of content and answer any questions from the audience if there are any. I don't see any questions. Um, a lot of people gave you uh, a lot of praise and said that there's lack of questions because your presentation was so thorough, which I fully agree with. Um, you definitely went into a lot of areas that I didn't even consider when when thinking about public speaking. And I think um, a lot of people, I mean, your, your audience held on pretty strong. So that means it was very engaging, very informative. So uh, thank you very much for everything. Yeah, this was incredible, Chad. You're, you're gonna be shocked when you hear about all the good comments we've seen coming in. Um, and I will, if anyone has any questions they do wanna ask, um, I'm going to share Chad's information in just a moment. You still have a few minutes if you'd like to ask it live, but in the meantime, I'm going to bring in Ted real quick with HMR. He's going to do our special copy giveaway. And again, Chad, I hope you are looking at this chat box. I know some of this everyone can't see, but this is really good stuff. So thank you everybody for watching. We are so happy that you found this um, very valuable today. I knew you would. Um, I'll make sure that we put this on our YouTube channel so you can refer back to it and share it with your colleagues. Thank you guys in advance for subscribing to our YouTube channel. Um, and again, I'm Chad, we cannot thank you enough for your time today. Um, I see Ted has popped in. So Ted, that means you're here to share some good news for one lucky winner. And don't forget, if you don't win today, there's always a chance tomorrow. And then next week, I'll be rolling out our August webinars. We've got a lot of great things coming up and I can't wait for you guys to hear and learn from them as well from our other speakers. Um, but Ted, who's our lucky winner today? Yes, I'm excited to announce it's a Matthew Healy out of uh, Denver, Colorado is our big winner today. So congratulations on some great coffee. Fantastic, congratulations, Matthew. Um, well, Ted, looks like we will be reaching out to him after this webinar so he can get his great coffee and thank you again so much, Ted, for all that you guys do over at HMR and for doing these special giveaways um, each week. We really appreciate it. We're also happy that you're back and you survived vacation. I survived vacation, yes. So <laughs> it's a long road trip to right. Florida and back, but it was great. So it was great seeing Chad and uh, listening to the presentation. It was, uh, it was really engaging, so I really enjoyed it. It sure was. And thank you so much for being here with us, Ted. We'll see you back here again tomorrow. And thank you again so much to you and HMR and Blue and all of our friends over there. Um, we appreciate everything that you guys do. You're welcome. And now I'm going to quickly pop on the screen the contact information for our incredible partners, as well as Chad and Jessica. I hope everybody watching will also stay in touch with everyone. And um, if you give me a few moments, I will be emailing this over to you as well. Um, but please stay in touch. Um, this is what we love so much about Connectionology is bringing all of you guys together and then hopefully learning something new that will help you in your practice. Um, so thank you everybody so much. And looks like there might be a couple questions that have come in, Jessica, is that right? Or just some more great comments? A lot of people, it seems to be the same question over and over again, which 
is a great question because a lot of people want to know if the slides will be shared. Um, yes, they will. I will send those over to uh, Ginger uh, and I'll make those available to folks. I also have a paper on it. Uh, if folks want that, we'll just send it over in one fell swoop. Sounds great. Fantastic. And Chad, thank you so much for all that you do. Um, if anybody happens to be going to Savannah, be sure to look Chad up and you guys should get together. Um, but send him an email, stay in touch. And again, Jessica, thank you for all that you do. Um, you guys are amazing. I almost hate to end this webinar today because <laughs> these comments are incredible, you guys. Thank you so much. Um, we hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. We'll see you back again at three o'clock tomorrow and then um, have a wonderful evening. Bye, thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>